Welcome back, ladies and jelly spoons, to the Notcast number 371. Uh, today is the 1st of April, 2024. And I am going to be talking about an album which has a great meaning to me, uh, and I still love dearly, even though it is 32 years old. It is now older than I was when I first heard it, because I think I was 20. No, 19 when I first heard this record. In fact, uh, my friend Mike in Leicester promised me that he'd do me a tape of it because I couldn't afford to buy it. I still haven't got that tape, Mike. Where is it? But that's okay, I've forgiven him now. Uh, the album is Morris's fourth solo uh, studio LP, Your Arsenal. And I'm going to be talking about the album, the singles, the live shows, the tour, everything that goes with it, like I normally do uh, when I do a notcast. I'd also like to give a shout out to the people at morrisseysolo.com that said that the one about Kill Uncle was scarily involved. Well, when in the absence of having a life and having some obsessive compulsive personality behaviours that have manifested themselves in trying to know absolutely everything about everything, I too am quite invested in this record. Um, as a, a, another update, and I did mention obsessive compulsive behaviour. I don't think it's a disorder. I think it's a different way of seeing the world. And uh, if you, if like me, you've, you've lived in a world that doesn't necessarily make a huge amount of sense, or as uh, Axel Rose said on stage in New York, a man trapped in a world not of his own making, or when he was talking about Slash, um, I thought if I knew everything about everything, I'd find the code, I'd crack the code that made sense of the reality around me that otherwise didn't make any sense. And lo and behold, I turned that into just being a walking depository of uh, pop trivia. And here I am, uh, guilty as charged, Your Honour. Um, for this album, Your Arsenal, um, we we'll have to go back a tiny bit to, to what happened before then, which was when Morrissey put together his first solo band and did his first solo tour in 1991. So he pulled together a lineup of uh, four musicians uh, who'd been in other bands, uh, mostly playing together on the rockabilly scene in the UK. Uh, they are, respectively, and here is the gatefold. Um, that is uh, Alan White, a man who has more co-writes with Morrissey than anybody else on the planet. Uh, 78 released songs and 84 known songs. Uh, this is Gary Day on bass. Uh, some guy called Morrissey, you might have heard of him. I think that's Boz Bora there and Spencer Coburn on drums. And at least three of those had been together in various bands working together before effectively um, finding a lead singer who would then lead their band. Uh, so Morrissey and Your Arsenal, I think of Your Arsenal as actually being the album where Morrissey stopped being a solo artist for a period of time, and is actually the debut by a band called Morrissey that consists of five people um, who for many years made some fantastic music together. Maybe not necessarily always music that sat alongside the time, some of it definitely didn't, uh, but music that has stood up very well over the past 32 years. Um, there were some plans, in 1991 for Morrissey to release a Rockabilly EP, which didn't come to pass. Uh, that would have songs like Pregnant for the Last Time, You're Gonna Need Somebody on Your Side, and um, some, other, some other songs as well on there. The nearest we got to it was the six track My Love Life EP that was released in Japan. And since that was released in Japan, I don't own it. Uh, I have been keeping an eye on available and affordable copies in the UK. None have gone below 40 pounds recently. So I've decided I'd prefer things like eating, and food and sleep and a bed and a house, that type of stuff. I know, I know, I'm, I'm cheating on my one true love, my record collection, but so be it. Um, and so the Rockabilly EP kind of got folded into something else, which was effectively a new studio record from Morrissey, which was recorded between February 1992 and I think uh, the, the last bit of recording was June 1992. Um, it was recorded February 1992 at Utopia Studios in Primrose Hill, and that's where two songs are. Um, and uh, one was the, um, the National Front Disco, uh, uh, and I think the other one is We Hate It When Our Friends Become Successful. And then the rest of the album was finished at Wall Hall in Bath, which I think Wall Hall is uh, a studio that's been used by a great many people. Not long after Morrissey vacated it, I think New Order were in there. Uh, doing some prep work on the Republic LP. I could be wrong. Actually, they might have been in Peter Gabriel's Real World Studios, uh, but the idea of residential studios don't really exist anymore. Um, this album is probably my second favourite Morrissey solo LP, and uh, the time it came out was my favourite. Um, and uh, it's just absolutely magnificent in every way. It's, to me, the definitive 
solo album. If you were going to introduce solo Morrissey to somebody, you'd either go for this or Vauxhall and I, and you go, this is what it's about. If you like this, everything else will fall out of the sky uh, for you. And if you don't like this, you'll probably never quite get Morrissey as such. Um, I think it, it's the album that really encapsulates, I think, all the, the facets of his artistic identity most successfully alongside Vauxhall and I. And I think it's a definitive solo identity that he's got. Um, a kind of like a, a rockabilly band, but also with a hard rock edge, a bit of glam that's in there, a collection of ruffians um, that, that effectively kind of seize their one shot, their one opportunity to, to back a very, very talented singer and then went into a direction I don't think anybody could have ever really predicted. Um, Mark Nevin, who wrote a lot of the songs on the predecessor, Kill Uncle, uh, may have thought that he was going to be the principal songwriter, but as he declined the opportunity to tour the Kill Uncle album, and Boz Bora became that, that guitarist, um, he only put two songs into this record. Those two songs, by the way, are two of the finest songs on there. Uh, you're going to need someone on your side, and I know it's going to happen someday. Both songs I, I absolutely love and adore, and I've had the good pleasure to see performed live. Um, and Morrissey suggested that, that not only was he going to get a band identity, but he was going to get a, a producer that he admired historically. He suggested Tony Visconti, um, who'd made a lot of records with David Bowie in the 70s. That didn't come to pass, uh, but got Mick Ronson of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, uh, who died from cancer not long afterwards uh, in his last production work, uh, to give this album a muscular, physical feel, a strong strength of... Uh, almost like, you know, when you when you see a hand kind of tensed or, or, I don't know, when you look at somebody that's, I don't know, ripped or whatever the phrase is that they use for it, and you kind of go, yep, yeah, dude's got muscles. This was a muscular, assertive album that, that really kind of portrayed a worldview very, very succinctly and clearly and with a confidence that we haven't got on Kill Uncle. The arrangements were short, they were clear, there was very little flab in there, there was no wasted bars, there was not a sense of, uh, you know, one guy in a studio with a drum machine putting together uh, an instrumental track and sending it to Morrissey. Uh, there was a sense of four or five people in a room hammering out a racket and testing and testing and testing these songs until they were confident and complete and that they had absolutely no fat on the bone. You listen to this record and you get the sense that not only are the band excited about making it, because it was the first studio album recorded by most of the people in the band. I think um, Gary Day had played on some rockabilly EPs. Boz, I think, had played on, a, on an album in 1988. This was the first studio album that I think Alan played on and uh, Spencer as well. So the sense of this is the debut, this is the one shot, and you can't screw it up. You're going to aim for the target, and you're going to hit it. So that's exactly the sound that comes pouring out of the speakers here. It's not just that, but a band that's been for formed and honed by a year of touring across American arenas and European theatres into being this confident, assertive beast that knew what it was going to do and how it was going to do it. The previous problems that we'd had from, from the previous live performances, which was a band that, that had gone into arenas in effectively, you know, on a pub rock budget with cheap equipment that was forced by what you could squeeze out of your, you know, Camden Council pay packet, uh, had been replaced by a band that had equipment that, that sounded uh, right and matched the sound and vision uh, which was there. Effectively, Your Arsenal is the debut album by Morrissey as a band. And it is assertive and it's clear. And I mean, Morrissey said, I didn't have a regular band, so I needed to rebuild a gang spirit to be back permanently with the same people. And that, that comes through in this record. If you listen to, let's say, the Foo Fighters debut album, which is one man on his own, um, making everything, it's got this kind of sense of claustrophobic groupthink. This here has a five people and a diversity of thought, but also a common purpose that points against it. In the sense of like, if you weave, uh, let's say, you know, fabric or wool together, it's stronger because of the bonds that come from the multiple lengths as opposed to if it was a single piece of, uh, of, of material. It's five pieces of material that are blended together to create a, a recipe. And it works absolutely magnificently. After the tour, in 1991, the first release, the first fruits uh, from this album was We Hate It When Our Friends Become Successful, here in its UK CD format. 
uh, with three live songs on there. Uh, Suede Head, I Changed My Plea to Guilty, and Alsatian Cousin. The American CD in 12, which has an extra track on there. Uh, these live songs were, I think, recorded at Hammersmith Odeon on the 4th of October 1991 and taken from the soundtrack to the Japanese uh, television broadcast of live at the Hammersmith Odeon. Um, and it, it really kind of resets for you the idea of what the sound of Morrissey live was like alongside the early recordings of Cosmic Dancer and Disappointed, which one pregnant for the last time. You were then able, if you weren't able to see one of the shows, to get a feel for how good the live Morrissey experience was and is. And We Hate It When Our Friends Become Successful was the first single. It went to number 17 in the UK charts, Morrissey's first top 20 appearance for a little while. Uh, it was um, influenced by uh, Sean Ryder and the Happy Mondays and the Stone Roses and New Order because at 1992, Morrissey had been making records for nine years. And when you think about the generational shift that occurs in bands over time, you think each movement lasts a certain period of time. Morrissey could have been seen as being one of the artists that defined the 80s. And he was moving into the 90s without necessarily being able to define what the 90s was. And you know, by the time that we hated when our friends became successful, was released, and by the time it was recorded in February 1992, not only had Manchester happened, not only had we had, you know, the, the happy Mondays and the Stone Roses and James and the Charlatans and all these other bands coming from Manchester. Electronic featuring Morris's former, uh, you know, writing partner Johnny Marr, for example, um, who'd moved on with the times. Morris, he was starting to look like part of the old school. And the, the spirit that was encapsulated in bands like the Stone Roses and Happy Mondays was this, this edge of, of more wild abandon, less insular, introspective. Uh, kind of hedonism, uh, but more kind of. I mean, the album. This album's called Pills, Thrills, and Belly Aches. For example, that tells you everything you need to know. There's no way a Smiths record would be called that. It probably would have been called I Took Some Pills and Now I Have a Belly Ache and God Knows I'm Depressed Now. If it was, uh, you know, uh, the Smiths covering um, Pills and Thrills, for example. And uh, the Stone Roses, of course, had that, that same era of almost arrogant hyperconfidence that comes from a point of desperation. You know, songs like I Am the Resurrection, there's clearly there's a, you know, a parody edge to that. But at the same point, when you listen to it and you kind of go, they're really bloody good, aren't they? But this was the sound of the future. And as uh, the Stone Roses sang on She Banks of Drums, the past was yours and the future is mine. So we hate it when our friends become successful was the first song that was released by Morrissey where he, he clearly kind of seemed to be aware of the fact that he was taking a place in the you know the long-standing history and legacy of what was happening around him as opposed to leading from the front um, the the Kill Uncle album was not the right album for the time it's a good album really really like it but not the right album for the time necessarily and the live material on here was, was I think in some ways designed to kind of assert that that Morrissey was still you know a valid and an important kind of artist operating in a slightly different sphere. Not so hedonistic, not so uh, more introspective, but at the same point, you know, with this new band, it reset Morrissey. It was almost like a reboot. You know, like when you get, uh, you know, a new James Bond, not George Lazenby, but Roger Moore or Pierce Brosnan or somebody, kind of going, you know, still, still the, you know, the same person that you know and love, but at the same point, also different. And new, um, and we hate it when our friend becomes successful. Was kind of a response to that. The lyric around the people that weren't successful in Manchester, that were bitching about the people that had been successful, the people that felt that they'd been overlooked by success or perhaps passed over. They just hadn't made that jump to commercial success, uh, and also the people that were looking at their successors in the next generation of music and kind of going, oh, this means I'm now a legacy act. I'm now built into history. And that's a strange position to be in. You know, the, the idea of we hate it when our friends become successful and if they're Northern, that's even worse. And look at those clothes and that video. Oh, and it's all a, a really interesting, bitchy, funny song about success and how actually, let's be honest, failure is the default position for most people's lives and artistic careers. Success is the rarity. And that's where you're dealing with it. And when, of course, if you are successful, uh, there's an element of looking at it and thinking, I could be more successful. 
I could be selling stadiums instead of arenas. I could be doing multiple nights at stadiums instead of one night at a stadium. Uh, and it's all kind of gradual. And then you kind of go, where is the top of the mountain? Where is the peak of what you're looking for? And are you going to know when you're actually at your peak moment in your life? Again, this is it. This is as good as it ever bloody gets. It can never get better than this. And, and one day that's very fatalistic. As you look at it and go, it could always be better. You know, when someone said things could always get better, as the uh, things can only get better, as D. Ream later said in 1997, or you can kind of go, can't get any bloody worse, things can only get better from here. Or that you think about it, it can be optimism and positivity at the same time as negativity and pessimism. And a good pessimist will always tell you they're not a pessimist, they're a realist. And I call bullshit on that. But We Hate It When Our Friends Become Successful was a great solo single and most people kind of, it got to 17 but it wasn't you know like the kind of Stone Roses getting to number two, number three, Happy Mondays and also obviously even that part of, of culture uh, had been started to be lapped by the rise of Nirvana and Grunge, Soundgarden, uh, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, all those bands. So Manchester was starting to look, Morrissey's Manchester was starting to look two or three uh, kind of eras past where it had first been born. Uh, and you then up ending, as Noel Gallagher said, better to be a has been than a never were, possibly is maybe one way of looking at it. It is a great song. It was also covered by James at Glastonbury in 1992. Morrissey was due to pay uh, Glastonbury in 1992 and played uh, one show supporting Madness at Finsbury Park where he draped himself in a Union Jack flag uh, as captured in this photo in the uh, Your Arsenal uh, tour programme. Although, of course, this, you don't see Morrissey in that particular shot. And the um, unfair enemy cover story at the time that caused him to pull out of Glastonbury um, and he was replaced by James, fresh off the heels of Sit Down, Sound, Born of Frustration, the Seven album, which was just about to come out. And James opened the show with We Hate It When Our Friends Become Successful, which was cheeky and lovely, given that James had supported the Smiths and Morrissey had been a, a long kind of supporter of that man. Uh, if I remember correctly, and I need to know how the timeline works for this, I think the second single to come out from the album was released before the album was released as well um, and only by a matter of you know days or weeks that is possibly the worst titled uh, single that Morrissey released around about this time you're the one for me fatty available here on 12 inch single and CD single uh, and if you look very very carefully you'll notice that the 12 inch has a slightly bigger picture of uh, Morrissey with his hand in a belt. Uh, well, you can piece these two together. So this was recorded in February 1992, uh, hot on the heels of knowing that Nirvana and Smells Like Teen Spirit had taken over the world. And it takes this new kind of muscular rock sound and it has a glam rock tinge to it. Uh, it was, I mean, obviously no coincidence that it was produced by Mick Ronson and engineered by Peter Jones. Um, all of the songs, at this point had a swaggering confidence, a semi-rockabilly, semi-glam sound to it, bright shiny guitars, big riffs, thundering bass lines that, that really kind of set it aside, I think, from, from what the rest of, of you might have thought Morrissey was going to do next. Because, you know, you can take the piss out of Morrissey, very, very easily done. You can go as kind of moping, sad indie minor chords, kind of talking about how everything is awful and terrible and if the sun's shining, why is the sun picking on me? That type of stuff. Whereas You're the One For Me, Fatty, is the complete opposite of that. It's a bright, breezy, fun, silly song. The type of song you wouldn't expect from Morrissey. The type of song whereas if somebody said, have you heard the new single by, oh, I don't know, let's say Nirvana or the new song by Nirvana and it's called I Hate Myself and I Want to Die, and you might sit there and go, are they taking the piss? Because you might have listened to this and go, Morrissey's singing You're the One For Me Fatty, really. So in full transparency, not my favourite Morrissey single because I think the use of the word fatty is um, impolite. Uh, I don't think I know anybody that would quite like to be called fatty at all. Um, it's a joke lyric. Uh, it's a joke lyric that's aimed to Cathal Smith of Madness um, about how they would spend time together, you know, drinking and heart 
having fun and joking about and Kathle uh, might put on a bit of weight because he was drinking and so on which by the way if you drink a lot that does happen uh, and since I've cut down my drinking I have lost a considerable amount of weight thank you for not noticing um, it does happen but it's also a pun on a song by the uh, the Marvelettes from 1971 called you're the one for me baby um, and it's a fun song it's flippant lyrically it's very precise yeah it has a lyric about all over Battersea some hope and some despair uh, which is one of the things I think about. But it's not perhaps the most obvious love song that you would ever think could or should be exi exist. And I think Morrissey, to be honest, by the use of the word fatty, which is completely irrelevant in the big context of the song, it spoils what could have actually been a really, really nice, sweet love song. Because if you've got a girlfriend and you sing, her, you're the, sing to her, you're the one for me, fatty, it's not going to go down well. You know, that's kind of a sensitive subject for some people. Uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm not quite sure how else you might want to go for it. Um, the video of, for this song is not great. Um, it's easily available on the, uh, the Malady Lingers On promotional, uh, well, compilation DVD. And in 2000, the Region 1 Oyesteban uh, DVD as well. What's interesting about the video is that it has a slightly different audio mix of the track. It has a, a pre it has a pre-release mix of it that was kept for the video version. Uh, it may have changed that audio actually for this DVD, uh, but certainly the, the version that was sent to the TV stations to broadcast had a different early release mix of the track, which wasn't the one that was used on the, on the finished single. Um, and it's, it's, you know, lovely and fun and I've seen it played live a few times, but it's not, it, I don't, I don't feel entirely comfortable about the use of that word. There are two, Fabulous B-sides on this single, and I have to be really clear about them. I think all the B-sides around about this period are very, very good. So the first one is Passionate Love, uh, which is uh, spelled Passionate, and uh, was first played live in Leicester on the 8th of October 1991. The first song uh, to be played live by the new lineup of the band, or to be written by a member of the new lineup of the band that was played live. And yeah, I saw I saw it because this was the gig that I saw my first Morrissey gig at. Passionate Love was in the middle of the set, rammed in between Every Day is Like Sunday and Piccadilly Polare. Um, and it, uh, Passionate Love is a great song, actually, really underrated. It's a kind of rampaging, rollicking, rolling, kind of fun little bit of, of flippant rockabilly really interesting strung melodically uh, and it's a simple song about the mystery of love a song about you know make your grandmother's toes twist and curl and uh, hair burst out into spots or whatever it is you know it's it's again like you're the one for me fatty it's a song about abandon and about belonging and about finding somewhere or something where you feel like perhaps you've found a sort of home a really good song wish it was played live more often I think it's great, Passionate Love. There Speaks a True Friend on the 12 inch. There is perhaps not so great, still good. Uh, it's an interesting lyric, a precursor, I think, to My Life is a Succession of People Saying Goodbye, which was on the one of the B sides from the You Are the Quarry era. It's all about how, um, although it takes its title from a film called The Killing of Sister George. Um, uh, which is a, a film about an ex-friend kind of speaking the truth, the idea of saying something to somebody that they don't necessarily want to hear and then them not talking to you anymore. The lyrics to there speaks a true friend, kind of mine roughly the same territory, which you could then link into perhaps Morris's paranoia stroke concern stroke observation about the fact that um, he has burnt through a series of personal relationships with co-workers, co-bandmates for example over time and um, you know, managers sound engineers you know cats everything and uh, it doesn't i mean obviously inspires a certain form of loyalty amongst certain people including members of his fan base uh, of which i i was one uh, and still am to an extent um, but you kind of end up thinking well if your life is an endless succession of people saying goodbye what is driving that what is the cause for it you think about red flags that you've got from people yeah if they've got no friends from their childhood that's kind of a red flag because that means that somebody uh, that they knew when they were like five has, has either annoyed them so much or they've annoyed somebody so much that they're not talking anymore um, really interesting red flag to hear that one actually really good and you should always keep in touch with your friends as the wedding present. Uh, hello, it's the wedding present t-shirt. Um, ha have it 
uh, on one of their previous songs. So You're the One For Me Fatty, great record actually, really enjoy it, good 12 inch, silly song, wish I'd changed some of the words. It got to, I can't even remember where, 16, I think in the charts, 18, something like that. I'm not sure, really. And then we had the release of the album, Your Arsenal. Here it is. This is it. This is a, you know, one of my favorite Morrissey LPs. Now this is an original 1992 EMI Parlophone edition, uh, which you can probably tell by the fact that it's water damaged and clearly very, very old. This version here is the 20th anniversary vinyl repressing in a gatefold sleeve. This is the copy that I play because this one is clearly very, very tired indeed. And there are some differences between the two editions. So this one um, has a different font. Um, now on there, it has the EMI logo in the top corner. The back cover is different uh, there. This is a non-1992 photo. The, uh, the track listing is exactly the same, but a, the alternate mix of tomorrow is included on there. And this has a gatefold sleeve, uh, which has the pictures of the five band members, which this version doesn't. This is also, I think, the first Morrissey or Smith's LP that doesn't have lyrics on the inner sleeve. And the reason it doesn't have lyrics on the inner sleeve is to draw attention to the um, the, the muscular sound of, which, of, of the songs to which the lyrics are but a part. But here it is, Your Arsenal. What a, ma a magnificent record this is. And this, this photo, I think, is... I, I must admit, I can't remember now. I think it's um, a gangster and his child. Uh, a London gangster, someone who maybe worked with or was associated with the craze. Maybe Mad Frankie Fraser. Who knows? Um, on a beach in the 50s. Um, Your Arsenal is a, a fabulous record. Opens with one of my favorite Morrissey tracks of all time, You're Gonna Need Someone On Your Side, which I've seen Morrissey open a few gigs with. Brilliant track, actually. One of the best album openers I've ever heard. I've talked on another very, very early episode about album openers. This one does everything it needs to do. It's the opening song and within about 30 seconds to a minute of the song, you go, I've got this. I know exactly what this song is about, this album is about, and I completely understand what it's going to do. And it also does this, the thing that you should have on any LP, which is it brings in the instruments clearly, definitively, and assertively in the first minute or so. It opens with a cymbal crash, huge amount of guitar power chords, and a rampaging bass line that slowly builds up. And the bass line, I think, is based upon uh, the cramps. It's based upon things like the Peter Gunn theme. It's got a touch of the Batmans in it as well. That whole da na 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 Batman, you know, that kind of thing. Maybe, maybe it actually should have sung You're the one for me, Batman, which would have been funnier, but perhaps not quite so uh, so successful. And the, the idea that you've got this kind of Batman style glam rock rampage, clearly influenced by David Bowie, T-Rex, um, you know, other glam bands, but from a modern perspective, while also at the same point being aware rather than having a nod to modern production techniques and even the influences of bands like Nirvana that were absolutely inescapable in late 1991, early 1992 in terms of sound. This sounds phenomenal. The production is fantastic. The song, You're Gonna Need Someone On Your Side, one of the Mark Nevin co-writes, is wonderful. Um, and there's just, everything about it is superlative. It's, it's probably, oh, it's in my top 20 Morrissey songs. Maybe not my top 20 Morrissey and Smith songs, but my top 20 Morrissey songs, undoubtedly. Uh, and this being the first LP made by the band that would go on to make several more LPs, I think six or so more LPs over the next few years in various lineups. It really does sound like an amazing debut and uh, had this been the first record that Morrissey would have released uh, with nothing previously, no Smiths or anything, I'm pretty confident uh, he would have had a very successful career just on the basis of how good this record is, actually, and Boxall and I. Um, it would have been a very different career trajectory, but would have very definitely have achieved the recognition and success that he felt he, he, he deserved. Now, the second song on the album is Glamorous Glue. Glamorous Glue is, well, again, one of my favourite Morrissey songs. Uh, it well, didn't get a single release at the time. It got a promo CD. It did get a release as a single in 2010, and here is, or 2012, and here is the picture disc, 
and the seven inch version. There's also a CD single of it. I've put somewhere, but I can't remember where it is. Both of these are backed with Viva Hey era outtakes, being respectively Treat Me Like a Human Being, clearly taking its name from a New York Dolls track. And this one, Safe Warm Lancashire Home, clearly not taking its name from a New York Dolls track. Um, but Glamorous Glue uh, is just a great song. Again, it's got this kind of whole slightly threatening, slightly furtive, slightly glam rocky kind of sound, but clearly restraint that, that kind of plods and doesn't plod in a bad way, but in a measured, determined speed. Um, it is a Gene Genie ripoff. If you listen to the guitars on this the uh, and the bass line, um, and that's not a bad way. Homage is a, a very important part of being a, a music fan. Um, but it recontextualizes that song and those lifts and turns them into something else. So it's about a sensitized or a desensitized switched off nation. You know, the idea and then the lyric, you know, we vote, we won't vote conservative because we never have. London is dead. London is dead. About the idea of looking to, and clearly influenced again by the rise of Nirvana and the permeation of American cultural identifiers across the whole of the world is, um, especially, I've talked about this in previous episodes, the, the, alienation that you get when you're watching a Hollywood movie and you're seeing Los Angeles and unless you've been to Los Angeles you kind of look at it and go I don't recognize that world that's a movie world whereas if you watch a film that's set in the UK uh, and not necessarily central London but if you watch a film like Sightseers by Ben Wheatley which is set in uh, Nottingham for example and you go I recognize that street I recognize those houses I've been in houses like that so the idea is that London is dead and that uh, we look to Los Angeles for the language that we use really really sits very astutely upon that but also around the idea of the provincial little Britain the idea that that Britain is fantastic and everybody needs to bow down to it which is also highlighted in the uh, the England on his t-shirt and some of the references to national identity and to England for the English elsewhere inside the Your Arsenal album as a lyrical uh, record it is chock full of songs that identify and talk about the concept of national identity starting with glamorous glue through to uh, we'll let you know with songs about you know the last british people you would ever want to know the national front discos uh, england for the english um, and some of the other songs as well and it, it clearly kind of identifies that there's a, there's a national identity here that that needs to be addressed but not necessarily allow it to overrun or overrule the conversation that takes place. Um, Glamorous Glue, released in 1992, is a song about a nation that had been pretty much under the jackboot of the Conservatives since May the 4th, 1979, where Thatcher had said, where there is disharmony, let us bring hope, where there is, um, you know, whatever, let us bring unity. Uh, it ended up by saying, not too many years later, that there is no such thing as society. Uh, we are all just individual consumers scrabbling over each other to be successful and to have our own little slice of the pie. And, and the Conservatives at this point, in 1992, although they won the election in 1992, which surprises me greatly, actually, and still does, were a nation that at least had, had practised a divide and rule. So the concept of a managed decline, where they decided that they were going to run down towns like Liverpool, Swansea, mining communities, by not investing in them, to centralise everything into London, where it would be easier for them to, to move their money into the heart of their own bank accounts and to effectively treat the, the United Kingdom as an investment that they could manipulate in order to make themselves richer was was really quite alienating for somebody that, that grew up in a, a marginalized and, and and generally overlooked part of, of britain called birmingham um i always got the feeling that, that that birmingham's existence was tolerated when i was growing up there and it certainly wasn't the center of the cultural discussion at the time so we looked to los angeles for the language that we used because london is dead and that also applies to both the the concept of america dominating culture but also the fact that london itself with its centralism wasn't speaking in a honest and open fashion to the rest of the uk and the rest of the uk felt that there were actually two countries wrapped around inside each other one full of incredibly rich people in london and the other one full of not incredibly rich people not in london um the Conservatives were starting to feel, or, or by the 1997's election, 
um, were losing the popular vote. Uh, they'd lost touch with the voters. They felt, I think, a little bit crushed. The nation itself in 1992 felt that somehow it was trapped in an abusive relationship with a government that it couldn't really get rid of. And we were seeking escape from a cultural homogeny and uh, from a, a financial kind of dominatrix approach that um, the big businesses were taking to everybody else. And yeah, sure, I've spent far longer talking about Glamorous Glue than the song itself actually lasts for, but it is magnificent. It's one of the best songs uh, which Morrissey has ever sung. I absolutely love it. I cannot say the same for the next song, We'll Let You Know. It's a song about football hooliganism. It's a song about, you know, we're all smiles and honest. I swear it's the turnstiles that make us hostile. It's a song about how... Um, in, the, in the, the quest to find an identity, people will cling to something. Um, so they'll cling to bands, they'll cling to identities, they'll cling to football teams. That's part of going, you know, like one of the questions I'm always asked is, which team do you support? Now, my answer is always England, uh, because I don't really follow football, uh, which is a weird answer. Most people don't get it. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily see things like borders, nations, cities, counties. They're artificial divisions. We're all part of the same planet. And in fact, we're, if this were the sea levels much lower, not only would we all be dead, we'd all be part of the same landmass. So the idea of drawing a line on a map and going, well, them are the baddies and us are the goodies, seems a little bit arbitrary to me and a little bit um, useless, really. Uh, so the idea of um, the, the uh, what's the word I'm thinking of here? The, the localism. Of, of being a football fan just does not work for me at all. Um, but the song is about football hooliganism, about finding an identity, uh, about possibly kind of conflating the idea of football support with 1984's Two Minute Hate. Um, uh, there was also, um, I think, a, a book called Away Days, which kind of talked about, for example, football hooligan gangs that would go to different cities and stir up fights. I always remember when I went to Birmingham City Centre and there was the ramp that was at New Street, which is still there, by the way. And sometimes on Saturday mornings, I'd have to check what matches were on because I'd have to go, well, have Villa and Blue is going to have a fight on the ramp before the, uh, the match, because that's often one of the things that happened. There was this kind of cultural bloodletting which took place. Now, of course, everyone's calling each other names on Twitter uh, and, 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 uh, and all that type of stuff. But it was almost like a bloodletting, really, a way of uh, safely exercising the, uh, or using a safety valve to get rid of the tension of having to live in modern life. The book was also inspired, oh, sorry, the, the song was also inspired by a book called Among the Thugs by Bill Buford, uh, which does also appear in a suede video. And um, I read Amongst the Thugs, and I was 20, and I was kind of going, I'm really glad I'm not part of this, because it sounds quite violent and, and a little bit unpleasant. Um, attempts to understand the element of tribalism and localism through, through the lens of football hooligans. And it's almost a requiem for the loss of identity uh, when those type of subcultures get taken away from each other. Um, there is a sense of belonging inside that. It's a sense of belonging that I have inside certain band fandoms. But we'll let you know is perhaps a little less perfect for me in that respect, in so much as um, that it kind of covers upon the element of, well, this is why I prefer music to football. Sorry if you love football. If you love football, absolutely great, brilliant. I'm, I'm super happy for you, it doesn't work for me. If you go to see a band, everybody's on the same team. They're all cheering for the same team and the hits are always gonna happen. You're, so it's not a, a zero sum game here. It's that everybody wins as opposed to being a football element which has a degree of a slice of pie, which is in order for us to feel good, you have to feel bad. Um, and, and that's kind of why I stick to music and not football, sport ball uh, at all. Um, we'll Let You Know is a, a good track, but I don't like the lyrics necessarily. But that's on me, it's not on anybody else. It absolutely isn't. Uh, the next song is the National Front Disco. That is lyrically problematic because if you haven't got a lyric sheet that's in front of you and the lyric is a, uh, has the line England for the English, very easy to be misinterpreted as meaning something which it doesn't. England for the English goes in quote marks in this song. And it should be, but it's unclear because there isn't a lyric sheet. So the lyric is about, oh, we've lost our boy. God save our boy. We've told him again and again and about how the, the boy has been um, drifted from his family because he's found something that he works to. And the idea of going to a National Front disco is, 
Well, as Alan said to Morrissey when he said, uh, wrote the song, and uh, Morrissey said, I've got a title for this song, it's the National Front Disco, and Alan said, you're going to get slaughtered for this, which was reasonable and understandable. Um, I think the lyric could be better. I think the lyric could be less ambiguous in a certain respect. I think the use of the word National Front, the NF at the time, when I was a kid, growing up in the 80s, and I'd see NF written on, uh, you know, big paint on the walls of my school and stuff, and I was like, Nottingham Forest, they're not that good, are they? Why would anyone paint that? Um, but then, you know, I grew up in Birmingham, which was the place where Eric Clapton said something about people that he didn't like, where I think Enoch Powell went to a school in Birmingham and he did the Rivers of Blood speech. The idea of, of you know, all of that stuff kind of ties in with the experiences that you would have. And so to me, the National Front Disco is, is perhaps a song where I think the lyrics needed to be a little bit clearer, a little less ambiguous, uh, and a little bit less of an agent provocateur uh, around them, because I think there are some things where you have to be pretty clear around what your political opinion is. There's a sympathy in the lyric around not having a sense of identity and not knowing where you belong, but it doesn't necessarily track um, if it has that ambiguity as well about it. Track five. Uh, oh, by the way, I should say, National Front Disco ends on a fantastic bit of guitar feedback. I really would put it at the end of side one of the LP as opposed to track four, because track five on, on the album, and this is a, a lovely, lovely song, is Ride a White Swan by Tip. No, sorry, Certain People I Know. Certain People I Know is a complete homage to Ride a White Swan by T-Rex. You can listen to the two and you can hear them together and you can go, right, those two are exactly the same song. It was released as a single in the UK, uh, not many other places, I think a promo in the US because no one was really buying singles in the US at the time. And it's a song about the danger of having friends and how sometimes, you know, you have to pick your friends very, very carefully as to who they are and, and who you hang out with. Um, but it's a, a lovely, simple, silly song. Uh, it has the line about they look at danger and laugh their heads off. By the way, the cover to certain people I know inside the Your Arsenal tour booklet here uh, features Morris's name inside uh, a union flag there, uh, which is perhaps uh, decided that that might be a bit too... Uh, risky to use for the commercial release of the single. I will get to the B-sides of certain people I know shortly because side two, we hate it when our friends become successful and uh, you're the one for me fatty, uh, is then followed by seasick yet still docked. Uh, again, place eight on the LP. It's based upon Joni Mitchell's The Silky Veil of Ardor, I believe, although I don't know that song particularly well. And again, a song about feeling seasick, but used as a metaphor around having too much to drink, feeling a little bit queasy, not necessarily sure of where you are or where you belong. So for example, even in a place where you belong on land and you kind of sit there and you kind of feel disorientated by the reality that you're living in, even if this is where you belong, because you've spent so long away from home that home doesn't necessarily feel like home anymore. There is um, a medical condition, and I forget the name of it, but I know Justin Lockie from Editors has it. Uh, one where you feel like your body is perpetually in motion because if you do too much traveling, your body doesn't equalize to the fact that you've got stability and staying still. So you always feel like you're in movement and you feel a little bit seasick whilst you're still docked. Genuine medical condition, pretty rare, does happen. Um, and I think that's where seasick yet still docked comes from. We're into the last two songs of the album now. Um, we have one of my very, very favourite Morrissey songs of all time. I know it's going to happen someday. A song so good, David Bowie covered it. And let's be blunt, David Bowie's cover versions normally a bit crap. And his version of I Know It's Going to Happen Someday, a bit crap. But really, really good for Mark Nevin's bank account, I think, um, and for Morrissey as well. It's to go, David Bowie listened to one of my songs, liked one of my songs enough to be able to cover it. I mean, that's, that's kind of a, an experience. Um, the original demo of this was called French Epic. Um, and it is this, this the, the version that's on the album is one of the finest pieces of music I've ever heard. Although it does lean into the end of Bowie's rock and roll suicides when it comes to its thundering climax. But it does so shamelessly and effortlessly and it sounds like it always could have been part of the song. You know, it starts with this rising guitar arpeggio that almost feels like it's coming out of the mist. You know, like when you drive to what, if, if you've ever driven in the mist, by the way, or a fog early in the morning, and I, I drove past a, an abandoned abbey in, uh, on the border of Wales and England about 25 years ago, just as the sun was coming up in order to get to a meeting in Chepstow. And we went past the abbey that's on the border, I forget the name of it, and it kind of came slowly out of the fog. 
Um, and it was beautiful and magnificent. And it looked like, you know, the Cure to the Cure's Faith album had become real in front of my eyes. And that's how I know it's going to happen someday. Kind of hooves into view. It is a magnificent opening, actually, for a song. It just kind of slowly hoves into view, builds and builds, and suddenly the drums come in. Morrissey starts singing. I know it's going to happen someday to you. Please have faith. Don't lose faith. Uh, it's not too late. All those type of things you kind of go, and certainly in 1992, I felt pretty hopeless about a number of things. You know, I was like, where is this life of fun that I was promised? Where are the things that, that I was told are going to happen to me during the course of my life that didn't happen? Now, admittedly, I was only 19 at the time that I heard that. There was a heck of a lot more time to come. There was quite a, f a few more things I had yet to experience and so much to learn. But at the same point, I was like, I don't, I don't see why I have to wait for certain things. I don't see why I have to graft for certain things. I'd quite like to have the same problems everybody else has now, really. As a, and uh, it's certainly for me, one of the things that's, that I've, I've felt and perceived is that my life has seemed harder to me than the way that I've perceived most people's experiences of most of their lives have been to them, actually. Not saying that, you know, all, all lives are easy and that they don't come with, with heartache and stuff. Um, but it seems to get me to the point that some people just took for granted when they were 22 or 23. It took me a lot more work and a lot more effort to get to that point uh, and a lot more time and a lot more tears. Um, still, as a, a friend of mine that works in, uh, in, um, in healthcare says, there is not one untraumatized human being on the planet. And oh boy, I've got a fair chunk of that. Uh, in this, but I know it's going to happen someday. Is, is just a song full of a beautiful romantic optimism about someday. Uh, don't lose faith; it will happen to you. But at the same point, it could be seen as a little bit threatening because of how it's designed to go. You know, the thing that that you you're dreading is going to happen to you as well. So it depends what you bring to it as much as what you take away from it. I think uh, is 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 for that song. And then the the last song on the album, the fourth single or third, if you or, or first actually, if you're in America, uh, is the track Tomorrow uh, here featuring Morrissey and Gary Day uh, on a beach. I'm not sure Morrissey and Budgie Smugglers reading Variety is perhaps the, the finest record cover we've ever had, um, but. It's a, it's a good track, all right. I uh, really like it. And these, uh, this shot of the boots, by the way, is, uh, I think, on the last page of the Your Arsenal Tour booklet. So there, there you are. Um, this is backed with uh, two non-album tracks, uh, uh, which I will get to shortly. But Tomorrow Itself is a great song. Really good. You listen to it and go, third, fourth single off the album. Absolute banger, really excellent, splendid one. It's built on this, you know, this huge chorus line, this this massive guitar riff. Um, and you know, when when Morrissey said in 1991 that you know, mark my words, in 10 years' time, you'll talk about these musicians and say they were as good as or better than the Smiths and the best musicians I've ever worked with. Not the best ones, but really bloody good. Certainly, this era is my favourite era and these writers are my favourite writers that, that Morrissey has worked with during the course of his solo career. And there have been a lot of writers that he's worked with during the course of his solo career, undoubtedly. But, uh, you know, T Tomorrow is a, a great song. It's kind of a, a sequel to Please Help the Cause Against Loneliness. It's got a, a reprise to that. So instead of going, you know, Please Help the Cause Against Loneliness, would it help if I sent my home address or, you know, my inside leg? It's more like, you know, uh, tell my shiftless body uh, tomorrow is it really going to come I know you don't mean it it's all this type of stuff so it's kind of like a continuation of the themes that sit inside please help the cause against loneliness it's, it's got this rampagingly brilliant bass line from Gary Day uh, who doesn't get I think in anywhere near enough um, respect uh, for, the, for the work that he brought to the um, to the to the Morrissey albums, um, and and also of course Johnny Bridgewood who, who replaced Gary for a couple of the other records um, and did a magnificent job as well, um, and it just soars on this like, huge set of riffs, uh, and you get the feeling that you know were this a band and this were the debut, is everyone going that is a band to watch that is a fan fabulous debut so you think about your arsenal as being the debut album wow what an album to to release as your debut really uh, and then at the end of the lp mix because the single mix is is uh, remixed by the way and has a different ending the end of the lp mix is uh, just a, a slight reprise of a very gentle piano motif uh, similar but not the same to sleep a song 
by a band called The Smiths, you will undoubtedly will have heard of. So, B-sides time. I haven't really gone into the B-sides yet. Since tomorrow, and certain people I know were released roughly at the same time, tomorrow slightly ahead of it, um, there is a track called Let the Right One Slip In, which is on the B-side of tomorrow, which eventually got a UK release five years later on the Viva 8 uh, Centenary Edition. Let the Right One Slip In, uh, it was played live once in 1992 in New York. I think it's been played live a couple of times since then, around about 2014, 2015. Um, I, I think it's really great. Lovely, fun, breezy, fun song. So many of the songs from this period are actually fun, and fun is underrated. When most people think of Morrissey, they don't think fun, and they bloody well should do, because even though there's there's you know sadness in a lot of his songs, there's also joy. And if you know where to find it, it's right there. It's just not obviously in your face. Um, and it was uh, inspired the name of the, the book, Let the Right One In, and also the films uh, which were made recently about vampires is you've got to let the right one in. With the vampire mythology is that you can, uh, a vampire can only enter if he is invited in to, in to participate in the area. On the second uh, or third single in the UK, there were two B-sides. Uh, these are You've Had Her and Jack the Ripper. And um, these two songs, You've Had Her and Jack the Ripper, are first very important in the Morrissey canon of work. The first co-writes with uh, Morrissey's other guitarist, uh, Boz Bora. And um, you, You've Had Her is, is perhaps about promiscuousness and emptiness, whereas Jack the Ripper, a song that is still played live to this day, is one of the best Morrissey songs of all time. It was recorded twice, before the finished studio version was finished. The first recording failed and was at Abbey Road in 1992, and then it was re-recorded at, and let me just quickly check, I think what looks like Sea Salt Studios in October 1992, over two days just before the band went on tour. Um, and it was then remixed and uh, then issued um, on, on the B side of the seven inch and the 12 inch and the CD of certain people I know. And Jack the Ripper, Follows on from the trend of other Morrissey songs, in it, uh, such as Suffer Little Children, Last of the Famous International Playboys, a song about a famous murderer, um, but also has the subtitle of The Last Thoughts of Jack the Ripper, which is uh, Jack the Ripper himself was never, never mentioned in the song, uh, but they're about, oh, you look so tired, your face is black and cold, um, ill-housed and ill-advised. Uh, come into my arms, you know, and, and all that type of stuff. And it's a song about almost like a love song from a murderer to the woman that he's about to kill. Uh, could be lyrically dodgy, but isn't. He's put on this, this beautiful, kind of wonderful, epic soundscape that comes to an exhausted stop. The live version of Jack the Ripper, uh, which is the version that's used on compilations, is played a key up and they've changed the tone of it. It makes the vocal more assertive and it sounds more realistic which is a shame that the studio version doesn't follow that trick, but you can't have it all. So that is your arsenal and all its attendant B-sides. Uh, and here is, of course, the CD. There was a, a reissue of your arsenal in 2020, well, sorry, 2012, I think. Uh, this version, which I've shown you, it features a live DVD of the band performing in 1991 before the release of your arsenal but playing two songs from the uh, from the period one is passionate love and the other one is we hate it when our friends become successful because no shows on the 1992 tour were officially shot uh, for film release um, so there we have it and when morris's um, live potential there was also um, a live album that was released in around about may 1993 or thereabouts uh, beethoven was death this song is now unfortunately or this album is now unfortunately deleted it's a, a, a magnificent splendid assertive great live album uh, really really love it sounds brilliant listen to it and go oh my god what an amazing live rebirth he's got there um, and it's it's just one of the best live albums um, it does suffer it says 16 songs performed live at the zenith in paris on 22nd of december 1992 in front of six and a half thousand people not strictly true about half of the album was recorded at the London Astoria a couple of days before, and the track listing for the released version of this was massively changed from the actual gig. So at the actual gig, We Hate It When Our Friends Become Successful, which is the last song on the CD and LP, was the first song that was played. There was also uh, Alsatian Cousin and um, Tomorrow, and I think uh, it last of the famous international playboys that were played live on the show that are not included on the live album. So you go, you're missing three songs from this. But aside from that, 
this is, and I think pretty sure that Morrissey didn't want to release anything until he got to the point where he felt his band could match up to uh, the promise and experience of the Smiths' Rank Live album, which this album absolutely does. This is a confident move by Morrissey that's been reborn as a solo artist in, in full kind of capacity of his powers. There are loads of bootlegs that released around this period. This is the, one of the more common ones, Poetry Hour, uh, which was recorded in Colorado, Boulder, on the 1st of October 1992. It's a mixing desk recording of the whole show, apart from the first two songs. You're going to need somebody on your side, or you're going to need someone on your side, and Glamorous Glue. And this features the, the set in order, including some songs that aren't on, uh, about Hove and his death, particularly Girl is Likely To, Tomorrow, he knows I'd love to see him. Oh, no, that's on it, isn't it? Alsatian Cousin uh, and so on. And uh, this is a, a really great performance, so pick it up if you uh, want more of live Morrissey. Uh, finally, there is one unreleased song from this period, uh, which did get a release in 2006 or 2009 on the Southport Grammar reissue, but also on this Record Store Day EP uh, in 2020. Uh, this one, uh, the track is Fantastic Bird. It says that it was recorded during the Southport grammar sessions. It wasn't. It was, uh, there was one take that was made of Fantastic Bird in 1992, uh, and it is on this 10-inch and the reissue versions of Southport grammar. It's okay. It's not amazing. Uh, it's pretty surprising it didn't come out, but I'm glad that it exists and that we've got it. Um, and that is, that really, that, that is, you know, Morris's Your Arsenal album. It was only a year. Um, I mean, the tour was quite short. Uh, it was one US leg, um, which was September to October and November. And there, and this tour program is from the, the first part of that tour. Uh, there was um, some extra dates that ran through to November. There was a, a short UK tour, Sheffield, Manchester, probably Glasgow, a couple of shows in London. I didn't get a chance to see those. Birmingham as well. I know James did. Hi, James wish I'd gone. Um, and then there was about three or four European dates. Uh, and then 1993, it was a year out um, where terrible, terrible things were to happen into the world of Morrissey. But that is for the next episode. So, Your Arsenal by Morrissey. I love this album. It's my second favourite Morrissey solo LP. It's a magnificent record. Uh, it's one of the best debuts I've heard. Um, and uh, it's the, the debut album by a band called Morrissey as opposed to his fourth solo LP. I think very, very highly of it, and I hope you do too. Uh, and I hope that by listening to this and to uh, watching this and, and listening to the record that you will, you will find new things to discover inside the grooves of this LP. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up. Hope you enjoyed it. Like and subscribe. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves and each other. Stay beautiful, beautiful ones, uh, and I will see you all soon. Good night and thank you.